Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Richardson. I work in the communications department here at the Bank of Canada as the Director of Stakeholder Relations Initiatives and I'll be your moderator for the session today. Welcome to our first Retail Payment Activities Act webinar, all about understanding retail payment supervision. Today we're gonna to focus on the topic of registration. We're happy to see so many of you are able to join us today for our live event. We're recording the presentation to make it available for anyone who could not attend. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on the land of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis. We pay our respect to Indigenous peoples across the country and to their ancestors for their immeasurable contributions to this country. We are joining today from Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I'm delighted to be here today with Nikhil Chandy, the bank's senior director of enforcement and registration. Over to you, Nikhil. Hello, hello everyone. Very excited to be with you here today in this webinar. Uh, we were gonna be covering the registration topic and uh, we've got lots of great information for you, including who needs to register under the Retail Payments Activities Act, which we often shorten to RPAA. We also are, will be talking about what the registration process looks like, as well as some of the expected timelines. So let's first talk about who will need to register with the Bank of Canada as a payment service provider. There are four criteria, and you can see these on the slide, that need to be met to be within the scope of the RPAA. We're going to explore each of these in more detail, but at a high level, here they are. Number one, you are a payment service provider performing one of the five payment functions under the law as a service or a business. Number two, you are performing the retail payments activity in relation to an electronic funds transfer. Number three is that you are within the geographic scope of the law. And the last of the four part test is that you or the payment activity that you're performing is not otherwise excluded under the law. A PSP that is within scope of the law must apply to register with the Bank of Canada and submit the application fee starting November 1st, 2024. So now let's dive deeper into each of those four payment uh, functions. There are four tests to be, uh, to be un within scope of the RPAA. The first step is that you're a payment service provider and to be a payment service provider, you must perform one of the five payment functions that are listed under the law. And we've got these here on the slide for you. The first is that you provide or maintain a payment account for the purpose of maintaining EFTs. And it's likely you're providing or maintaining a payment account if you store personal or financial information about end users to make it easier to carry out electronic funds transfers. The second of the functions is that you are holding funds on behalf of an end user. It's likely that you are holding funds on behalf of an end user if you keep funds at rest and available for future withdrawal or transfer by an end user. In other words, by a payor or payee. The third function is that you are initiating an EFT at the request of an end user. You are initiating an EFT if you launch the first payment instruction requested by an end user to start the electronic funds transfer. The fourth uh, function is that you are authorizing an EFT or that you are transmitting, facilitating, or receiving instructions related to an EFT. You are authorizing an EFT if you establish whether an EFT can be performed. And this includes enabling end users to give or withhold consent to send or receive electronic funds transfers. You are transmitting, receiving, or facilitating an instruction about an EFT if you send or receive payment instructions or if you provide the infrastructure that enables payment instructions to be sent or received. And the fifth and final function under the law is that you are providing clearing or settlement services. Uh, you are providing clearing services if you are preparing and calculating payment obligations that need to be ultimately settled. 
and exchanging information to support that settlement. You are providing the settlement services if you are enabling the transfer of funds or the adjustment of financial positions to extinguish financial obligations between other participants in a payment system. So those are the five payment functions under the law. Now, a payment service provider under the law performs one of those functions as a service or business. The RPAA does not capture payment activity if it is incidental to another non-payment service or business that you may offer. Several indicators can help you assess the relationship between any payment functions that you perform and any of your non-payment services or business activities. So if your payment services directly generate revenues or other benefits for you, if you are marketing your payment services, or if end users expect to receive payment services from you, then these could all be indicators that you are providing the payment function as a distinct business and not in a way that is incidental to your other non-payment business. On the other hand, a payment function is more likely to be considered incidental if you perform it exclusively to sell your own products and services. For example, you could provide a payment function that allows for your customers to buy your products uh, from your online store. This is likely incidental and not in scope of the RPAA. However, it is important that you take a holistic perspective when considering whether activity might be incidental. Even if some of your payment activity is performed incidentally, you could still be a PSP that performs another payment function as a distinct payment business. And if that's the case, you will still need to register with the Bank of Canada. The second part of our four-part test as to whether uh, you should be in scope of the RPAA is whether the payment function you perform is in relation to an electronic funds transfer, a placement or transfer or withdrawal of funds by electronic means, so not including cash transactions. The EFT must also be denominated in Canadian dollars or some other fiat currency. The law does allow for other types of currencies, such as virtual currencies, to be settled through, uh, to be added through regulation, but none have been prescribed at this point. The third part of the test is to ask whether the PSP is within the geographic scope of the law. And there are two ways that this could occur. You are within the geographic scope if you are a PSP with a place of business in Canada. So that's one way. Or you could be a PSP that does not have a place of business in Canada, but end users in Canada are using your payment services and you are directing those services to individuals or entities in Canada. And we have a chart on the slide that can help you assess whether you are within geographic scope, depending on your location, as well as the location of your end users. The fourth and final step is to apply any of the exclusions that are found in sections six through 11 of the RPAA. The act provides exclusions for entire PSPs, as well as for certain activities performed by PSPs. So entity-based exclusions remove an entire individual or entity from the scope of the law. These include financial institutions such as banks or credit unions that are already supervised in Canada. It also includes Payments Canada and it includes us, the Bank of Canada. As well, agents or mandatories of registered PSPs are excluded. The law also allows for individuals or entities to be excluded through regulation. And the global financial messaging operator SWIFT is excluded this way. Now, activity-based exclusions remove certain payment activities performed by PSPs from the scope of the Act. This includes transactions made at a merchant with a closed-looped gift card or at merchants with a limited-use instrument, such as a shopping mall gift card. It also includes transactions at automated teller machines, uh, so no bank machine transactions, as well as internal transactions among affiliated entities 
For example, if a PSP is simply moving money for accounting purposes among affiliates and not as a payment service. Eligible financial contracts and prescribed transactions, such as payment activity associated with derivatives or securities transactions, are also excluded activities. And payment functions performed directly in a system designated by the Bank of Canada under the Payment Clearing and Settlement Act are also excluded. This payment activity on designated systems like LINX or the ACSS uh, that activity is already supervised by the Bank of Canada. So now we have covered who needs to register, applying that four-part test. I want to now turn to the process of registering. Once you have determined that you need to register by consulting this webinar, as, whether, as well as other materials on our website and tools, you will need to create an account through the IT system that we are building, which we will call PSP Connect. To help you through the application process, we will be publishing a step-by-step -step guide to registering. Stay tuned for that, it's coming. You will be able to use this guide to help you complete the application form through PSP Connect, along with pay the application fee, which will be $2,500 for 2024. So PSP Connect is a web application that will be the interface between us, the Bank of Canada, and any PSPs. PSP Connect will become available on November 1st, 2024 for the start of our registration. The system will allow you to apply for registration, update your information, pay that application fee, and it will also facilitate communication between ourselves and PSPs. You don't have to wait though until November 1st to start preparing for registration. In fact, please don't. This slide will help you see what types of information you will need to provide when you do apply. It includes things like contact information for you and for any third parties or agents or mandatories or affiliated entities that uh, you have. It also includes your business structure, your ownership, uh, key staff or debt holders. It includes the retail payment functions that you are providing uh, or that you are planning to provide, as well as the agents and mandatories uh, or affiliates that may be providing those services on your behalf. It includes whether you have a plans to establish a risk management framework or an incident response framework or whether you have one already. And if you hold and use your funds, it includes, uh, it includes information about those funds and the number of end users that you have in Canada as well as abroad. We also need to hear about any registrations that you have for retail payment activities under FinTrack or other federal, provincial or territorial authorities. When you apply, you will need to pay a small nominal application fee. The fee will be $2,500 when registration begins on November 1st, 2024. It will rise over time in line with the formula that is set out in the regulations. Now paying this fee is part of completing your application. So we will not be able to begin even assessing your application, even knowing whether you are to be registered or not until we have seen that that application fee is paid. I do want to point out that the fee is not refundable, even if we ultimately determine that you should not be registered with us after applying. However, it is not an annual fee. It only needs to be paid once per application. So once you have applied through PSP Connect, the bank will notify you, confirming that we have received your complete application, including that fee. The bank is expecting potentially thousands of PSPs to apply, so it is going to take us some time to review all those applications, and therefore the law includes a 10-month transition period for the bank to be able to review all of the applications that we get. The bank will only publish our initial registration decisions once that transition period has ended on September 8th, 2025. As we review the applications, we may need to ask you for more information. 
and we ask that you would promptly respond to any information requests that we may make. Now, during this transition period, we will share with the Department of Finance and FinTrack any implications that we have already assessed to be within the scope of the Act. Finally, we will publish all our registration decisions once the transition period has ended on September 8th, 2025. We will publish a list of all registered PSP, as well as some of the uh, tombstone information that goes along with them. And we will also be publishing a list of individuals or entities that were not registered, including potential reasons. So what happens if a PSP does not register? Well, a PSP that is in scope of the RPAA must register with the Bank of Canada on November 1st, 2024. The law provides existing PSPs with a 15-day application window to apply. So as of November 16th, 2024, a PSP that has not applied to register will no longer be permitted to provide payment services that are within the scope of the RPAA. Individuals and entities that wish to start operating as a PSP after the 15-day application window but that have not yet applied must submit their registration application at least 60 days before they plan to start performing retail payment services that are under this law. We will be monitoring individuals and entities that we suspect should be registering with the Bank of Canada. We will be reasonable in our approach to compliance, uh, so we will give PSPs that should have applied an opportunity to rectify this. However, the bank can take enforcement action to ensure that individuals or entities comply with the law, including the obligation to register with us. Some situations may require an already registered PSP to submit a new application. This could happen if an individual or entity plans to acquire control over uh, an already registered PSP, or if a state-owned enterprise plans to acquire that registered PSP or obtain a right to appoint senior management. That is another situation that requires a new application from the registered PSP. And it is important that the Bank of Canada receive this new application before any of the planned changes take place. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about timelines. And this slide gives you a high level overview of the activities that we have coming in the next few years. We plan to publish several pieces of guidance to help the public better understand what the requirements in the RPAA and the regulations mean in practical terms. So on December 12th, 2023, we already published our criteria for registering payment service providers, as well as a scope self-assessment tool. And then in Q1 of 2024, we will consult on draft guidance related to the operational risk, fund safeguarding, and reporting requirements that will face PSPs. This will allow us through this consultation to finalize uh, the guidelines but on our requirements by Q3 of 2024. We also will publish that step-by-step -step guide that I mentioned earlier to help PSPs through the registration process. And all of this is gonna come out before we start uh, our registration pilot in April of 2024. We want to give PSPs through that registration pilot an opportunity to try out PSP Connect it will allow us to test our system and our processes before registration actually begins for real on November 1st, 2024. And we are accepting volunteers to join our pilot up to December 15th, 2023. Now the last date on this timeline is September 8th, 2025. And that's the date I mentioned earlier where we will begin publishing our registration decisions. This is also the time when the regime's risk management requirements officially come into force. So thank you very, very much for your attention today. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Nikhil. Uh, the recording of today's session will be posted shortly to the Bank of Canada's YouTube channel. 
Uh, we're not going to be sharing copies of the deck following this presentation, but you can always go to YouTube to see the presentation. And watch your emails. We'll be sending out a post-event email. This was our first webinar in this series, and your feedback will help us ensure that the next one is even more useful. Watch our website for details on when those next webinars will take place. And last, don't forget to sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date with the latest news. Thanks, Nikhil. Thanks for all of you. Have a lovely afternoon.